Today, we're gonna to talk all things Facebook audio. It's been a mystery to me for a long time what they're doing in the background of your audio streams, but they've made an upgrade to the codec they're using inside their apps for how they're delivering streaming audio. So what does that mean for you and how's that gonna affect the way that you mix your church's live stream? Well, let's dive in and find out. Hey, if you're new here, my name is James and I help worship leaders and sound techs get the most out of their audio gear and eliminate the mystery and frustration of sound at church. So if that's you, welcome. Let's mash that subscribe button and get on to it. Over the years, I've gotten a lot of emails and comments about how the live stream that somebody sends from their computer does not sound like it sounds after it goes through Facebook and all their backend stuff for video encoding. There could be a lot of different reasons for this. One of the reasons is that they have to optimize the audio for all different types of data bandwidth. So somebody might have fiber gigabit internet at home while somebody else is listening on their mobile device over a 2G cell data connection. And while I wish I understood every bit of the audio processing that's going on behind the scenes at the advertising slash spy agency called the Big Blue F, I don't. However, they did post about a new algorithm that they're using for their audio streaming that's supposed to make it a whole lot better. So I did some tests to see if it makes a real big difference and if it's gonna make it so that you don't have to mix your audio stream as well in order to be heard better better on the other end. We'll find out what the results are in a minute, but you're still gonna have to learn to mix well. That's the bottom line. So let's talk about what happens to our audio when it leaves our fancy schmancy console and goes up to the cloud. The first thing that streaming audio wants to do is to save bandwidth. So let's nerd out a little bit to figure out the building blocks and figure out why things sound different on the back end than when we're mixing. Our ears perceive frequencies from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, and we group those in octaves. So we perceive the same distance between frequencies between 200 and 400 hertz as we do between 400 and 800 hertz. The top octave that we perceive from 10 kilohertz to 20 kilohertz has as much information as the rest of the audio spectrum if you're looking at it linearly, which is a tricky word to say. Short story, when you stream something, they lop off that top octave and you don't get all the shimmer and air and detail on your cymbals. So what's Facebook saying about this new codec that they started to employ? Well, it has dynamic range packets, which means just little sections where it's adjusting both the bandwidth and the dynamic range over time. They're saying they have actual level compensation. They're also saying it should have fewer interruptions and fewer artifacts. And artifacts are kind of the noise reduction that kind of is on the edge and it sounds a little bit robotic. Hopefully you've never had to hear that before, but it's not really pleasing and it's you know, no fun to listen to. So I went to the Audio Codec Company's website trying to figure out exactly what this thing is doing and how it's making it sound better. And they have some examples, little movie clips, where you see one and you see the other, and you can't really tell how they're different from one another unless you're a post-production audio geek and you've got golden ears, then, you know, yeah, you'll be able to hear that and pick it out, no problem. But I've been listening critically to a lot of stuff for a long time. I still had to read it before I understood what they were doing. Now, I'm not saying that there's no upgrade to this audio, but that's professionally recorded audio that's really well done. It went through a mixing and a mastering process. A lot of people signed off on this before it reached my ears. But what happens to it if it's not a perfect mix, right? The number of churches that have really excellent broadcast mixes every week is pretty low. So what does it sound like with a normal mix? Or even if you sent a front of house mix to your stream, what would that be like? And could these new dynamic range packets and level compensation cover up some of the differences you have between, say, the level of the music and the level of the speaking in another part? Is it finally gonna solve all your problems of people having to crank up their TV during this preaching and then turn it back down really fast when the music starts again? So here's how I tested it. I took the front of house mix from one of my live mixes and added in the crowd mics, filtered them and brought them down to appropriate levels. And I sent that to a stream that I initiated on Facebook. From there, I turned on my iPad and I downloaded the spyware, I mean, the Facebook mobile app so that I could listen in the app and I could listen on the website. That's the thing about this codec is it's only available inside their app 
It's not available when you're on a browser. I'll let you hear the comparison in just a minute, but when I was listening through the browser, I had a lot of dropouts and I don't have a slouchy internet connection. I've got gigabit fiber at home and I even plugged my iPad in hardwired in case it was a Wi-Fi issue. Still, I had a lot of dropouts and there were a lot of interruptions and even some speed variation in the playback. The speed variation also messed with the pitch and, and I've even had worship leaders call me in a panic saying, help, I was out of town and we were listening to church in the car and my Facebook feeds went way up and way down in pitch. All of a sudden it was going crazy. Does your tuning software do that? Rest assured, no, it was not the tuning software. It sounded fine in the room. It's just when you have bandwidth issues and it's trying to speed up stuff to catch up to what it did, it will adjust the pitch as well. And so that's tricky. I noticed that a little bit in my test as well, although it wasn't as dramatic as this certain worship leader said it was. And Tim, I just hope you're not being over dramatic with me. Thank you. When I listened inside the app, the audio quality was consistent. I didn't hear any artifacts, especially in some of the low level things or right after an interruption where I could tell they were changing the audio quality back and forth. It really wasn't bad. It was really a marked improvement over the web browser. The thing is the stuff on their website that talked about volume compensation, I didn't notice. So I did a test where I had a big section of the music that came down and then a speaking part that's quiet at a normal dynamic range that you would find from a front of house mix that's not compressed being sent to the stream, right? So pretty wide dynamic range there. And they didn't compensate for it, like maybe the website might have intimated that they would. Now this volume compensation thing might be for when there are big spikes in the level, where it's got a normal level and maybe they boost it up automatically in the background. And then there's a big spike, the way that they process with two pass bit, I don't know, some nerdy stuff. They took two passes to fix it instead of one, so they get the audio levels more consistent. Maybe that was what they were talking about, not just the difference between music and speaking levels. So in the middle of making this video, I got a cold and my voice is down a minor third. So that's that. So let's look at the website that Meta Engineering put out and why they're embracing this new codec. And they talk a lot about loudness management, like, you know, different videos are different loudness. And they got a bunch of people making videos. Most of them are in this upper middle tier. Then they're talking about comparing different videos. Video A, really loud. Video B, not quite loud enough. Video C, just a little too loud. And so they're going to move it to their target. That's their idea of what they're trying to do. And they're also trying to make it, you know, so that you're, you know, in your headphones or listening to your speakers, not adjusting the volume. That's helpful. And then they have adaptive bitrate audio. So they want to deliver great quality, but they don't want to have interruptions. Interruptions are bad. Right, so we don't want interruptions, but there's a lot less bandwidth available. And the probability is that the people are on low bandwidth things. So how do you deal with that? So they break it down into little segments. So they call them IPF segments or immediate playout frames. And they contain the data that says, hey, do I play this quality or do I play this quality? And sometimes you can hear it switching back and forth. Other times the quality is high enough, you don't really notice it. Or they've made it so that the bandwidth is more efficient so that you're not noticing those changes. So you got higher audio quality than maybe a little later you're you know at the potential of buffering so they lower the audio quality and then maybe it catches up and you've got a better data connection and they will adjust that over time i really thought that these would be a lot better for figuring out loudness and i think my expectations were higher than what they were actually saying they would do they're saying with the input which is this green dotted line goes from zero to like way up here which is above the target with one pass drc or loudness range control, right? So they're trying to adjust the loudness. It would operate like a slow peak limiter where it would push it down really fast and then it would slowly recover back up to your max output level. If you've ever played around with a limiter on an output of your mix, you've probably heard it do something like this where something will get really loud for a second, it'll push it down and then it'll slowly recover. This is mostly for safety. You would see this on radio processors, right? Because they don't want to damage like, you know, multi megawatt transmitters and amplifiers there. So they would have a lot of limiting between the output of the radio station and the transmitter. So you might see something like this where it crushes it down and then it slowly says, okay, now you can come back up and that's the max output level. That's what we might expect from just a plain old limiter. Instead, they use two pass of their loudness correction so that even if the input goes up to way up here, they're just gonna go ahead and take two passes. They basically compensate for what they would have done here. 
so that they, it just goes straight up to the max output and it does its thing. This isn't actually going to fix your output levels if your dynamic range is too wide. I thought it might. I thought this might be like, oh, this is going to fix everything. It's not. I'm sorry. This is where you can find it. I'll put the link to this article down in the description so that you can find that and the link to the website of the people that actually made it uh, so that you can find that and listen to these audio examples here. So there's all kinds of stuff here, really nerdy stuff if you want to go check it out and you can see the videos of how they compare it and all the different things. Now, when I paid close attention to the way that the symbols came through on the app version versus the web browser version, it was pretty clear that the app version had a lot more top end on the symbols and I was getting better fidelity from the codec in the Facebook mobile app, which I promptly deleted afterwards and I made sure there was no banking information on my iPad either because I don't want them looking at that. So first up, let's listen to the audio from the app. So there's nothing really remarkable here, but I want to give you a baseline of what it sounded like. Let's give God a shout of praise. We love you, Lord. We lift you up. Be glorified in us. Amen. Okay, so that's pretty standard. Uh, let me do a little bit of editing here. The audio from the mobile site is very different. There's some changes in audio quality, there's some gaps, and it's gonna be obvious. Take a listen. We lift your name, Jesus be glorified. Let's give God a shout of praise. We love you, Lord. We lift you up. Be glorified in us, amen. So you can see it got almost a little bit robotic. Let me just play that last part uh, where he's talking and compare it back and forth. We lift you up. Be glorified in us. Amen. Compared to? We lift you up. Be glorified in us. Amen. Yeah, so that's a pretty strong degradation in the audio signal from the mobile site. There were other things that I was hoping it would do, like I was hoping it would raise the level of the spoken word, right, compared to the music portion, because that's probably what a lot of people are complaining about if they're complaining about your live stream, is that the level difference might be off. So would this codex fix that? And I couldn't hear any noticeable difference, even in the spoken word portion, from one to the other. There were a couple differences in the audio quality still, and that did make a difference, but it didn't mean that you can slack on sending a proper signal to it. First, we'll start with the mobile app, then we'll go to the mobile website. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand. Now, these weren't just the worst isolated incidents that I recorded. We could go through the entire test that I did and hear all the times when the mobile site was dropping out, turning into robot voices. It was not good. So in conclusion, if you're getting complaints about the broadcast audio for your church, is switching over to the Facebook mobile app going to solve all your problems? No, it is not. It absolutely will not do that. It's not gonna fix the dynamic range and the difference between the speaking and the music parts in your broadcast. You're still gonna have to fix that. Now, I have a system that you can use that works for a front of house console to get a broadcast mix that fixes all those dynamic range things without having to be very hands-on. And I describe it in detail in my broadcast audio course inside my membership site. You have to have a good setup. Whether you do that or mix through a digital audio workstation or have another person on an iPad and they're monitoring someplace else, whatever you have to do, it's gotta be good at the source Facebook's codec is not gonna fix it. Now, should you tell people to use the Facebook mobile app to get better audio quality and more reliability out of your live stream? Well, yes, you should, but you should tell them to do it on an old cheap burner phone that doesn't have any of their financial information on it. Facebook and Instagram's terms of service basically mean that they can look at anything that you do on your phone anytime and you can't really do anything about it. It's kind of like their privacy policy is more awkward than a bacon cheeseburger at a bar mitzvah. So that brings up the next question. Do I think that Facebook is making their web codec worse to drive more people to use the mobile app? So final thoughts, what do I really think about the codec? Well, I think the noise reduction and the increase in audio quality and bandwidth is awesome. I don't think that it's gonna change your dynamic range and make things better for people that are cranking up their TV during preaching and turning it back down during the music part. You have to fix that still. What I really think their auto leveling thing is, is how they adjust to when, say somebody unplugs a microphone, something pops through the audio stream and it automatically turns it down at that point. Those are the things I think their auto leveling 
and doing with their dynamic range detection stuff. I don't think they're trying to fix your stream to make it present all the time. But the bottom line is I care about your live stream sounding its best. So no matter how people are joining in with your church, they can do so without distraction. And that requires you to play a big role in making sure that the dynamic range is correct for your live stream between the singing parts and the speaking parts. If you want a free way to improve your audio stream, you can download my free guide, How to Lead Your Church Audio Stream Team. There's a link down in the description below. It walks you through some of the stuff you can do and some of the considerations you have to take in order to get a good live stream mix. Hey, if you like this video, go ahead and mash thumbs up. If you're afraid of people spying on you, go ahead and type tinfoil hat down in the comments below. And if you haven't yet, please consider subscribing. I hope I can earn it and make you into a sound ninja as well. As always, remember, it's all about the low end, avoid the sound tech solo, and nobody leaves church humming the kick drum. We'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.